400, 200 years ago, we still have them as if the Prophet وسلم, is talking to us. So never underestimate that. Cherish it. It is a miracle. It is something beautiful. It is a gem. It is a pearl. It is a connection to our Prophet Muhammad وسلم. So let us, you know, depart right now towards that garden. Garden of prophetic sayings. Let us have a look. This one is a very beautiful one, but it's a very long one. So I will, inshallah, tabarak wa ta'ala, read it and give you a part of the translation, but definitely the meaning and what we take away from it. It is a story about three men that were saved by their ikhlas. Three men that were on journey together. And all of a sudden, the Prophet ﷺ says, it started raining. It was pouring water, rain from the skies. And they didn't know where to go. So the Prophet ﷺ said, they were walking and walking and, and they were looking, but they weren't able to find a shelter until someone amongst them saw somewhere, how do you say that, a cave in the mountain. So they said, let us go, let us go to the cave. So they all went into the cave and then the Prophet ﷺ said, a rock fell down from the mountain in front of the cave. And it was so big that they were not able to move the rock. So I mean, back in the days, there was no tracking, no social tracking. There was no GPS, there was no reach because there were no phones, meaning that if a rock falls, in front of your, the opening of the cave and there's no other way out, you will die there. I mean, that's it. You know, no, nobody's going to come, nobody's going to know. So now they were there, says the Prophet ﷺ. So he says all of them were on the inside of the cave behind the rock. And one of them said, nothing but our connection with Allah will save us now. That is when Allah Jalla wa ala wants good for you. He closes all the doors in your life until you get to a point where nobody can or wants to help you. That you feel desperate. That you say, all the doors are closed. I'm knocking everywhere and there's no response. Nobody's home. And then we turn to Allah. It's supposed to be the other way around. The first door we should be knocking on is Allah's. Because Abu Hassan, when they asked him, why don't you ask people to help you? He said, why do you want me to ask somebody who can't, ask himself, who can't help himself? You want me to ask someone who is in need of asking someone, while all of those in need are in need of one? Allah. So now he said, the only thing which can help us is our ikhlas. They said, our connection with Allah. They said, how are we going to do this? The Prophet ﷺ said, this is what the way they were talking amongst one another. So now one, he said, well, by mentioning a deed we have done genuinely and sincerely for Allah's sake. Yani, an action which you know of that you never spoken about with people. That you have kept for your, to yourself. That nobody knows of. Not your parents. Not your children. Not your husband. Not your wife. Nobody. And this is the art of performing good actions. Because the only good actions that we take with us on that long journey are the actions which were purely for Allah's sake. So he said, okay. He said, so let each one of us mention an action, make dua while mentioning that action that we did sincerely for Allah so that he will open the door for us. Now this might seem to be very miraculous, but we believe that Allah has power over everything. We don't doubt that. Yes, we, we, we know that science would say that's impossible. But science just describes the tangible world and we believe in the invisible world. We believe, yes, we believe what science describes. If it doesn't go against our beliefs, we believe that, no problem. But they don't describe the power of God Almighty, of Allah Jalla wa ala. So the first one said, any, the first one, he said, Ya Rabbi, you know that each night, Whenever I would go with my sheep to graze and I would come back, I would milk them. And then the first thing I would do, Ya Rabbi, I would go to my parents and give them to drink before they would go to bed. But one night I came late and my parents were already asleep. So I went with the vessel filled with milk and stood beside their bed. 
and my children crying at my feet because they were tired. They were tired, they didn't want to go, they wanted to go to bed. And he said, but I refused. I was afraid that my parents would wake up hungry for that milk, thirsty for that milk, and that they wouldn't find me there. So, Ya Rabbi, I stood there the entire night, the entire night with two vessels of milk in my hand, in my hands, to feed them. And when they woke up, the first more thing I did, Ya Rabbi, was feed them, give them to drink and to eat. He said, Ya Rabbi, if I did this for your contentment, فَرِّجْ عَنَّا مَا نَحْنُ فِيهِ then give us a way out of the, the calamity we find ourselves in. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, the rock moved. But they said, not sufficiently for them to get out. That was one. And this is the power of being good to parents. This is the power of being a good child. One of the Salihin said, whenever I speak to my parents, I don't sit too far away and I don't sit too close to them. Because if I'm too far away, they don't hear me very well and it seems that I'm raising my voice. And when I'm too close and I'm whispering, it is difficult for them. So I try to measure the ideal distance between me and them whenever I speak. Another one said, whenever I walk down the street with my parents, during the day I walk behind them and during the night I walk in front of them. I said, why? Well... He said, during the day, the beggars come from the back. That's where they walk. They walk behind you, not in front of you. So the first one they will be asking for money is me. And during the night, the thieves and the robbers, they jump out of the bushes in front of me. So I will be the first one to be attacked. Another one said, the most difficult thing upon me is eating out of the same plate with my parents. They said, why? I'm afraid that they would have looked at the piece of meat they desire and I take it away. So, so he would not eat. He would pretend to be eating because he would be afraid that his mother or his father would look at that potato, for example, or that piece of chicken or meat, and that he just takes it away. And the parent won't say it. So this is the way that they would be. And then when the, this man carried his mother on his shoulders from Medina to Mecca, barefooted, like, I mean, the sand is very hot, it's boiling hot. And you carry your mother. And I see some people who come from Pakistan and from India, when I went to Hajj, they carry their mothers on their back. All the Hajj, they carry their parents. It's ajib to see. So now he said, Ya Rasulallah, <clears throat> did I pay my, my mother back now? So I'm going to drink. <clears throat> he said, did I pay my mother? The Prophet ﷺ said, no. You didn't pay back one single cry when she was giving birth to you. One single any expression of pain that came out of her when she was giving birth to you, you didn't pay that back. <clears throat> they say, what is the best thing you can do to be good to your parents? After their death, and if visiting the friends they had is a part of the sunnah. They look who were the people who used to visit your father or your mother, and who they did they used to visit, and you visit them. And also by making dua, of course, and so many other things, but one of the things, memorize the Quran. The Prophet ﷺ said, the parents of the one who memorizes the Quran will be brought forward on the day of judgment. The parents of the one who memorized the Qur'an. And it will be said, let them wear the crown of honor. So they wear the crown of honor. Let them wear the garments of honor. They are dressed with the garments of honor. And then the jewels of honor. And the Prophet ﷺ says, the crown on their heads give more light than the sun on a cloudless day. And then it will be said, to take them to Jannah. Now the scholars say, if this is the reward for the parents, the reward of the parents of the one who memorized the Qur'an, 
then what would be will be the reward of the one who memorized the Quran? You see that? What will be the reward then of the one who memorized the Quran? So now to go back. So it opened. We believe in that. We don't have a problem. We're not going to say, oh, maybe it was gravity. Maybe the, the floor was shaking. There was a, <laughs> an earthquake. So it moved. No, it was Qudra ilahiya. Because Allah says, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ The one who has taqwa, Allah will give him a way out of every problem and will provide for him from there where he least expects it. We believe this. We believe this. That's number one. The second one, he said, Ya Rab, I had... Yani he, he was... He had feelings for a woman. And I tried to do haram with her, but she refused. And she was the thing I loved most on the face of the earth. This is what the Prophet ﷺ is saying. And this is in Bukhari. And she was the thing I loved most on the face of the earth, but she refused. Until one day, when there a year where there was drought, and she was in need of money. So I said, I will give you the money, but you will have to do for something in exchange for it. And she agreed. But the moment I approached her, she says, she said, Ittaqillah, fear Allah. Don't do this in a haram way. She reminded him. And she said, Ya Rabbi. He said, Ya Rabbi, I left her with the money. And I never went back. And I allowed her to keep it. Ya Rabbi, and this while she was the most beloved woman to me ever. If I did this for you, Ya Rabbi. Farrija anna ma nahnu fi. Give us a way out. Once again. But not enough to get out. So what is this? The first one was good for his parents. The second one said no to haram and gave a sadaqah and left haram for Allah's sake. And that's a very difficult thing. Especially today where haram is everywhere. In your own house, in your own room, anywhere you go, you carry the haram sharer with you. That's a haram share. Yes. It's also halal. There's a lot of good things. I'm not saying a, a phone is a bad thing. It all depends on, comes down on how, to, how you use it, right? So, now when f this is calling you and you're not responding, when haram is inviting you and you say, I am leaving this for Allah, while nobody sees it, while nobody knows it, you will get, get that reward too. One day when you will find yourself in a problem, you can say, Ya Rabbi, one day, my desire to look at something haram was so strong, but I left it for your sake. Ya Rabbi, please give me a way out. And he will give you a way out. We need to believe that. Our trust in Allah should be stronger than our trust in anything else. So now, let's come back. The third one said, Ya Rabbi. The third one, they're almost out. The third one said, Ya Rabbi. He said, one day, I had people working for me. And I would pay them every time. And one of my employees went away and didn't come to collect his wage. He just went off. So I wait, waited for some time, but he didn't come back. And it was the wait of a month. So I invested that money. And that money grew. And what grew, grew. Until I had a lot of cattle, big pieces of land, which were the result of the money that I invested from that person. He said, and one day, that man after years and years came back. And he said, I came to collect my wage. And I told him, do you see that cattle? He said, yes. Do you see these camels? Yes. Do you see these horses? Yes, I see them. Do you see that land? He said, yes. He said, all of that is yours. He said, are you mocking me? Hey, are you mocking me? He said, no. He said, how so? He said, because one day you didn't collect your wage for a month and I invested that money and that is what came out of it. He said, and he just nodded and took everything with him. It was not like this man said, oh, that's very kind of you, but I can't do this. I just want my money, right? He said, okay. He took the cattle and the sheep and the horses and the camels and, and the piece of land and the man, you know. And he said, Ya Rabbi, if I did this for you, ففرج عنا ما نحن فيه. He said, so Ya Rabbi, if I did it for your sake, and he then please, and he end this calamity. And then the rock moved and they were able to get out. So the third one, 
from a fiqh point of view, it would have been sufficient for the man to give him back his money. Not what he had invested. But because his etiquette, norms and values were, values were of such a high standard, he gave everything which was the result of that money to that person. What do we take away from this? We say, أَتَوَسُّلُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ بِالْعَمَلِ الصَّالِحِ is that we are allowed to ask and beg Allah to accept our dua by mentioning things we did for his sake. So that's the hadith of these three people. Isn't it beautiful? It's ajeeb. So the first one was good for his parents. The other one was fighting his false passions and desires. And the third one was fighting his love for money. It was all about love. The one, the ones, the first one's love for sleep, love for his children who were crying at his feet, love for going to bed, everything he was able to put aside. Why? Because his love for Allah was bigger. And we can only do things, and we can only listen and worship Allah if our love for Allah is bigger than our worship for other things. Otherwise, it's not possible. If your love for sleeping is bigger than your love for praying, then you won't wake up for Fajr. Isn't it? So this is the way it works. Let us go to the next one. وَعَنْ أَنَسٍ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ قَالْ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ مَنْ فَارَقَ الدُّنْيَا عَلَى الْإِخْلَاصِ لِلَّهِ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَلِكَ لَهُ وَأَقَامَ الصَّلَاةَ وَآتَ الزَّكَاةَ فَارَقَهَا وَاللَّهُ عَنْهُ رَاد Someone who leaves the dunya, meaning the moment he dies, Yani, while being mukhlis, sincere towards Allah Jalla wa ala, wanting nothing apart from Allah, and then and who had the habit to pray, to pay zakat, he will leave the dunya while Allah is pleased with him. But there is a little tiny thing here. Man, how can you leave the dunya with ikhlas? How can you leave the dunya with ikhlas? What does it mean to leave the dunya with ikhlas? We have so many hadith where the Prophet says that if you die and your last words are la ilaha illallah, you go to paradise. But here it says that you have ikhlas while dying. How does that work? Ikhlas while dying. Well, it means that the last thing you will do on the face of the earth is give your soul back to Allah. And that the moment you die, that even in giving your soul back to Allah is for the sake of Allah, that you don't resist. You say, Ya Rabbi, Anta Rabbi wa ana abduk. Ya Rabbi, you are my Rabb and, and I am your slave. Everything I possess is yours. So Ya Rabbi, if you want to take my soul, I won't resist. I won't complain. So these last moments on the face of the earth, even if it were the last three days, two days, where you are really sick and where you are on your deathbed, you don't complain. You don't. You just remain mubtasiman, smiling, pleased with the decree of Allah Jalla wa ala, not sharing your pains with them. The only ones you will share your pain with are the nurses. Oh, do you have, are you in pain, sir? Yes, I am. Here or there. But when your family comes and you go like, oh, my back, oh, my head, is that the last thing you want them to see from you? The Prophet ﷺ was in pain. And he said one thing. Inna lil la sakarat. He said death has come with its agonies. The agonies of death. Wajaat sakratul mawti bil haq. Says Allah in Surah Qaf. And the agonies of death have come. They have arrived. But he didn't complain. The Muslim doesn't complain. There is a difference between sharing with people how you feel or complaining. So the ikhlas when you die is that you die as pure as you can. As, as subhanAllah, yes, as genuine as you can. And that you, you go to Allah, to the hereafter, whilst you submit yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the most difficult thing. Like in theory now, it's very easy. But when you know, you are sure that you're about to leave that door, which is called death, Death is not something like a blackout. Death is not something, a moment where you are not aware. 
from now on, there will be no moment in your life where you, where you will no longer be aware of anything. Your physical senses will stop working. But for the rest, you will be aware. So, yani, that is difficult. When you know, like, I'm heading towards another life and I'm leaving my beloved ones behind me, you do it with ikhlas. You say, Ya Rabbi, why should I be worried for the ones who I am leaving behind? Because who am I leaving them behind with? You. I was not the Razak. I wasn't the provider. I was no more than a means through which they were provided. I am not the caretaker. I am not the protector. You are, Ya Rabbi. And this is what we say whenever we travel. We say, Wa anta sahibu fi safar wal khalifatu fil mali wal ahli wal walad. You are the companion on my journey, but you are the khalifa over my wealth and my children and my family. So even when you travel, Allah is not in need of you or me in order to provide for people. People very often think, oh, what if I'm gone? Well, people existed before you and people will exist after you. That's the sunnah of life. So when you know, now go back to Allah, it's with ikhlas. Meaning, I genuinely believe that Allah will take care of them there and will take care of me over there. That's with ikhlas lillahi wahdahu. Ajeeb. Then the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Allah Inna ma yansuru Allahu hadhihi al-umma bi dha'ifiha bi da'watihim wa salatihim wa ikhlasihim Allah will save this ummah thanks to the weak ones amongst them not the strong ones you know why because very often those who are strong financially strong socially strong physically are very often the ones who invoke Allah the least and this is why the Prophet وسلم, said Allah will help this ummah to gain victory through their weak ones thanks to their prayer thanks to their dua and thanks to their ikhlas so why did he say the weak ones you know what the problem is what I found and I don't mean anybody in particular but people who have the most seem to be complaining the most. It's ajib. People who have the most blessings seem to be at the same time the ones who complain the most. Like we have everything, but we are going to complain about what we don't have. We look into the fridge in the morning, on Saturday morning, where we want to have a nice halal continental breakfast. And then we open and there is no cheese or there are no halal sausages. And we see everything, but actually the only thing we see is that which is missing. Saji. Oh, didn't you go to the shop? I told you last time, you always forget your sausages. SubhanAllah. Saji. And then you have people who wake up. When I was 18 years old, I went to Sudan to memorize the Quran. Whenever we would wake up, we would eat beans. Beans, that, that's, that was it. Or either, and I don't know what it's called until now, maybe somebody here knows it. It was milk, something like milk, but with something inside of it. Grains or, or I don't know. Do you know what it is? Anybody here from, from the area? So it was, anyway, so our, our, <laughs> Our uh, um, breakfast was that milk with some grains. You could say cornflakes, but it was a cornflakes. So, <laughs> so you would just go in it and you would eat it like that. And then in the evening, we, we would have food. And that was it. And we would have tea in the morning and like hot water, which was not boiled, but because of the sun, hot water you need to drink. As well as hot water, it doesn't do anything. It's like you don't drink anything. But nobody there complained. Nobody was complaining. When I was in Sudan as an 18-year-old new convert, you know what surprised me? Is that they didn't have a lot, but they seemed to be living with one dollar longer than we would live with a thousand. Because there was qana'ah. 
Al qana'ah is means that, that you are satisfied with what you have, and this gives barakah in what you have. I never heard anybody there complain, and they have reasons to complain. That was in 93, uh, 94. Subhanallah, and then people, when you walk down the street, right? That was in a time where there were not a lot of, a lot of Europeans in Sudan because it was a, a bit of a difficult period in time. So when they would see me, they would look at me and I would be dressed like a Sudanese. I would have this long, this long inana, like nine meters. <laughs> you, 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 need, you need two people to do that. I couldn't do it alone. So they walk around you like that. And then I would have these long, you know, sleeves. And then until the half of my ankles and I would have these leather low shoes. And I would be walking, people would be looking at me. And then they would ask me uh, in their Sudanese accent, from where are you? And I said, from Belgium. They said, what is your origin? I said, Belgium. I said, how? I said, I became a Muslim four months ago. And then they would just start doing takbir. Allahu Akbar. And then people, they would look, right? And then that was not a time where Allahu Akbar was something negative in the ears of people. Like now when you say Allahu Akbar when you're on a plane, that's my problem because every time I'm surprised, I say Allahu Akbar. So when you're on a plane, you say Allahu Akbar. You know? So I said, they said Allahu Akbar. And then other people, look, look, this man just became a Muslim four months ago. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And then everybody on the street started doing Allahu Akbar. And they all want to hug you. But the problem, not the problem, the thing is when Sudanese people hug you, they ask you about everything. Not in a bad way. How are you? I'm fine. How is your father? My father has died. Allah alhamdulillah. How is your mother? Is your mother alive? Yes. How is your mother? My mother is fine. Thank you. How is your brother? I don't have brothers. Okay. If you were to have a brother, Allah alhamdulillah. <laughs> so they would just keep on asking, hey, your grandmother, hey, your grandfather. And so you know what the thing is? Just by living that, your iman because of the beauty behind that brotherhood was so strong and sincere and true that just by the hug, you felt your iman increase. And that was like every time, every time they go, Allah Akbar, I said, okay. So, and I couldn't hide that I wasn't Sudanese, right? So I, it was obvious. So every time they were, even when I'm on the bus, for example, I was, would sit on the bus, they would ask me. So it was incredible. It was the most beautiful time in my life. And that was the time where I would, in Sudan, in the desert, it's like really cold. We would use Vaseline or other things because we would have these, how do you call that? Cracks in your, but they, these cracks, they can go very deep and you start bleeding. So uh, when I slept in the desert, it was like very cold. They had a concrete soil, which was made of the, for the students of Quran. I had no cushion, I had no blanket. My bag was my cushion and my blanket was that nine meter long. And I, I was really shivering and shaking. And nevertheless, yani, it were the most beautiful times. Why? Because my soul got nourished. Here, my body is nourished. My, my, my mind may be nourished. But what about the soul? And there, it was all about the soul. And when your soul is happy, you forget about all your other needs. When you are satisfied on the inside, then the other needs are secondary they're, they're not that important so anyway that's what i've seen in sudan and that's why i'm happy that my beginning was in sudan because i saw so many beautiful patient and generous people over there so anyway allah so the prophet says allah will save this ummah through the weak ones and he said and the first thing he mentioned here sallallahu alayhi with their dua why when you are in need, your dua is the best dua ever. You never noticed? When you really need something, you get down on your knees and you beg and you beg and you beg. And even when it doesn't come and you're desperate, you keep on asking because you don't have. And you know that Allah has what you want. The second thing he says was salatihim. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Istainu bi sabri wa salat. Look for your strength in your prayer. We look everywhere. If you don't find your strength with Allah, nobody will be able to help you. And then he said, Wa ikhlasihim, their ikhlas. I was amazed one day when I looked, when I watched the news, was on Jazeera, and a little boy's house got demolished. It was, was completely gone. 
He lost a lot of family members, but he still had a smile on his face. And they said, why are you smiling? He said, my brother and I, when our house was demolished, we were walking and I found my bike. And he said, nothing happened to my bike. He said, that's from Allah. I said, these children understand more than maybe a thousand ulama together. I mean, the ulama, the true ulama, they understand. I mean, books won't teach you that. So that Allah saved my bike. That's why I say, the abundance of what we have is for many a Muslim, his biggest test. Because we have and we complain. We talk about what we don't have. We talk about what we want so often that we forget to enjoy what we have. And the moment that we lose what we have, we will have a true reason to complain. Now, we're good. We're good. Doesn't mean that we don't have problems, but it can, can be much worse. So this is what our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sallam said. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa sallam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa sallam said, Yuja'u bi dunya yawm al qiyamah on the day of judgment, the dunya will be brought. That means all the actions which were for the sake of dunya. And then it will be said, Mizu ma kana minha lillahi ta'ala. Of all of this here, which they did in dunya, weigh it. And weigh what from it was for Allah's sake. Fayumaz. So it will be weighed. Wa yurma sa'iruhu fil nar. And everything which will be for Allah's sake will be safeguarded and everything which wasn't for his sake will be thrown into a hellfire. So, anyway, let's continue. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said إِنَّمَا يُبْعَثُ النَّاسُ عَلَى نِيَّاتِهِمْ People will be revived on the day of judgment in harmony with the intentions they had so maybe now you're not yet the person you want to be you have some problems with your prayers sometimes you don't know how to lower your gaze sometimes you might gossip a bit and backbite a bit you just, you might i i have challenges everybody has challenges and we always try to grow and we're not there yet but if you have in you that you want to work for it that you want to change, that you want to be transformed, and that you're heading towards that ideal image that you have of who you want to become, and you die before getting there, Allah will re give your, your life back on the day of judgment like that person who was that person you wanted to become. Can you imagine? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will treat you like that person. And this is why the Prophet said, The mu'min attains with his niyyah, his intention, what he can't attain with his actions. Like for example now, we know, and may Allah save them, I mean, that 18.4 million of Yemenites will die most likely out of hunger, out of starvation. Can you imagine? In a time where people throw away food, they will die because they're hungry. There are more people that die because they're too obese, because of the complications that comes with that, than people who die out of starvation over the world. Can you imagine this? So now 18.4 million will die, they say. With your knee, I'm asking you, if you were to have the money, would you feed all of them? You would, I know. Well, you're rewarded for that need. If you had the keys to stopping war on the face of the earth, would you? You would. If you would be able to protect the Palestinian children and so forth, yani to protect them, to shelter them against bombs and everything, would you? You would. So Allah Jalla wa ala looks at your heart and what you can't do because you're not able to do it, you will yet be rewarded for it. 
Sajib. So this is why we need to have a lot of niyat. No. Allah. So Yom Qiyamah, but on the other hand, if you say, well, I don't know if I want to be an imam or if I want to pray, or if one day I want to just go to Las Vegas and start going to casinos to make money, but I will wait because I can't do that now. I don't have the money. So I will be working, working until I have that money and then I go to Las Vegas. So now you die. You never went to Las Vegas. But Allah Jalla wa Hala will take your niyyah into account. Unless you ala niyyatin. You will be given life in harmony with your intention. So make your intentions as pure as you can because then you will be the most pure person on the face of the earth when you die. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَنْظُرُ إِلَىٰ أَجْسَامِكُمْ وَلَا إِلَىٰ سُوَّارِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ يَنْظُرُ إِلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ وَأَعْمَالِكُمْ Allah doesn't look at your bodies nor at the way you are shaped. Meaning He doesn't judge you by that. By the color of your skin, the color of, color of your eyes, the structure of your hair, your width, your length, your weight. Allah doesn't judge you by that. He says, but he looks at your hearts and your deeds. So now, you know what the problem is here? If you know that Allah Jalla wa ala looks at your hearts as much as he does, as he looks at your deeds, that whenever you're showing something beautiful, but hiding something terrible while doing something beautiful, it will go by what you have in your heart. You see that? You might be smiling at somebody you hate. You might pretend to love that person who comes into the room. Oh brother, subhanallah, I truly miss you. I was just thinking about you. Masha'Allah. SubhanAllah. And on, on the inside, you say, when is he going? I really hate him. I don't like him. I despise him. Or you give money because the people next to you put some money in the bucket huh? when they come around in the mosque, right? And you're not even spending on people. You're spending on the house of Allah to be taken care of, to function. So, and then you see somebody giving 20 pounds there, 50 pounds there, and you know you have, you've got 20 pounds in your what? In your pocket, but you also have a pound. You wish that the others would have given 50 pence so that you could give a pound. But now they give 20, 50, 20, 50, and everybody's looking at you. So instead of taking that pound, which you want to give, you take the 20 pounds because of them. And they will say, MashaAllah, the brother is really, every time when they ask him for money, he's so generous. He's just, he's just buying his hellfire by pretending to be somebody he, who he is not. And this is why our predecessors, they would ask Allah to forgive them every time they would give an impression on the outside, which wasn't in harmony with who they were on the inside. Is that clear? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at what? At the hearts and looks at the deeds. Are there any questions about what has been said up to now? Are there any questions? Usually you have questions. Nobody? I show. At what time is the the Jama? The Jama. Nine forty-five. We will go on for five minutes. Then we have a five-minute break, and then we have twenty more minutes. Inshallah. So all of these hadith, as you see, are all about sincerity. They're all about the art of doing things for Allah. And as I said during the khutbah, when you do things for the people or to get something in return from people, you're doing nothing more than a spiritual suicide. You are killing your own emotions. When, when, when you do things for people and they don't appreciate it, you hurt yourself. When you do things for people, maybe the ones you love most and that you take care of most are the ones who will turn against you one day. You don't know. So many people say it. I've done this for them and that for them. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they start talking behind my back or I had an idea and they stole the idea. I, You know, so many things. If you did it for Allah, you didn't lose anything. 
if you did it for Allah, it's still there. And this is why Allah says, watch out. Yani, that's not what Allah says, but watch out. It is better for you to not to do something than to do something and then mention it. قَوْلٌ مَعْرُوفٌ وَمَغْفِرَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِنْ صَدَقَةٍ يَتْبَعُهَا أَذَا says Allah in Surah Al-Baqarah. A good word which you give to people is better than to help them and then mention it. When people mention that they've helped you, it is like they take away your honor. Didn't I do that for you? And then you came to me that day and you asked me for this and I did it. And then you went this and do you forget that I bought that for you? And when you were in need of that, I did that for you? SubhanAllah. And then you feel like you melt away in shame and that if you were to have the possibility to return everything to that person, you would have done so. That's the way you feel then. So here, take it back. But very often, you can't give it back because you just don't have it. And this is why Allah says, and it's very clear that we need courage if we want to do things for Allah. Because today, the cheapest thing, and I've mentioned this more than once, the cheapest thing on the face of the earth today in the eyes of people is doing something for the sake of Allah. Brother, I will help you move for the sake of Allah. I will help you paint the mosque for the sake of Allah. Means for free, right? And then when they do something for the sake of Allah, they don't want you to remind you to remind them of it. They don't want you to criticize them. Like they say, I will be there at nine, inshallah. And the person arrives at two. Then you say, I can't say anything. He's helping me, Fisabilillah. He's helping me for the sake of Allah. So it would be rude for me to say, Why are you late? Because he will say, are you my employer? I'm, you can already be happy that I'm helping you. The moment you say, it's fi sabilillah, it should be better. The result should be better than if you were to be paid for it. Because now you, you are self-employed. You're a contractor. With whom? Allah. So the moment you do something for Allah, you give it the best you've got. Because then you show Allah that it's truly for him. Allah doesn't like half a job. Like they paint and then, yeah, I'm sorry, bro. Uh, I didn't finish the corners right there um, because I had another job that came up. So, you know, uh, money, I need to feed my family. Then all of a sudden, all these excuses. And you're too shy to say, but you've promised me. I've counted on you. You promised me to do it for him. Is that how you work for him? So... Ikhlas, if we from now on, and that's my promise to you, if we from now on never do anything to please people, but everything to please Allah, your heart will never be hurt again. That's a promise. If people don't see it, you don't care. People don't mention it, you don't care. People don't thank you, you don't care. Allah will thank you. No. Is that easy? No. It's the most difficult thing. It's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy. But it's easier than always to go broken hearted. Do the same with your husband or in our case with our wives or the children. You need to educate your children to say thank you, right? And to appreciate what they have in life. But you do that for the sake of Allah because you want them to be good children, not because of your ego. Is the difference clear? So you don't want them to be good children because I deserve it, because I'm the best parent on the face of the earth. No. You do that because Allah deserves to be worshipped by them through being good children to their parents. And that's the difference. So don't expect anything and you will be happy. And the moment you understand that, you won't stop doing good, good just because people don't do anything in return. And that's where people today think that you are weak. When you continue doing good for those who do nothing in return, are you really going to continue doing that for you? Last time, when you called him, did he answer? When you were in need, did he return a favor? No, he didn't. And then we men, for example, if our wives are telling that, can also be the other way around, then we feel like we, our honor, yes, you're right. He didn't do anything in return. No, I'm, yes, I'm not going to do this anymore. When you close the door to doing good, you are closing the door to a higher level in paradise. Done. <laughs> it is like, how do you call that? The, the tap? Okay, so it's, it's a tap which keeps on running as, as long as you want to. 
the hasanat, you can go more and more, you know, you can create a tsunami of water, of hasanat. But there you go, I will stop. Why are you stopping? You need that water to drink, no? You need hasanat to survive. So in very brief, this is what I wanted to say about this hadith. I ask Allah Jalla wa ala to make it beneficial. Ameen. So we're going to have a break for five minutes and then inshallah we will carry on. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa akhiru da'wan alhamdulillahi wa bilahi.